Amen, family. I hope you guys are excited to be here today. Amen. I guys are excited to be here today. You know, if you heard Nick's welcome, you're supposed to be excited. You know, if you heard the prayer by our brother Alfred, you're supposed to be excited. If you heard me sing God's praise, you're supposed to be excited. Good morning, family. It's a privilege to be here today. It's a privilege to be able to. Thank you very much, Lord Jesus. Ah, that's awesome. Aww. <laughs> it's a privilege to be here today. It's a privilege to be able to preach the word today for you guys. Of course, I would like to thank Osas for the awesome opportunity to be preaching here today. And of course, ultimately, God, just to be able to give us the breath so that we can be here and worship Him. You know, we've been, we've been through the three, two parts already of the Acts series. That is a four-part series, and today we're going to go through the third part of it. Right, you already saw the first missionary journey of Paul from the chapter 13, and now we're going to jump into the second missionary journey that is starts in the chapter 16 of the book of Acts. So you can already go in there, and it's what God has to do. But, you know, I was thinking about it, and at the last sermon that we had, and, and how I was showing the persecution. And all, all the church was being persecuted. And we saw it all the first time there's the blueprint of the church. And all of that, and I was thinking, man, that's suffering. That's suffering. And you know, Aidan Wilson, he once he says in a quote saying, to be right with God has often meant to be in trouble with man. Wow. To be right with God has often meant to be in trouble with man. But the question I have for you today, are you ready to be in trouble with man? Are you ready to be in trouble with your family? Are you ready to be in trouble at your job, at university? You got to be ready for it. Because if you're preaching the same gospel that Jeremiah preached, the same gospel that we saw Jesus Christ himself preaching, the same gospel that got John Baptist decapitated, so you got to be ready to be in trouble with man. Because that's the gospel we're going to preach. And you know, Leonard Hemphill, that is a preacher at that time, he said that if Jesus had preached the same message that ministers preach today, he would have never been crucified. He would have never been crucified. The question is, do you think that the measure being preached today to your family would get you crucified? The measure preached at your job would get you crucified. The measure preached at university would get you crucified. Because if it's too good to be true, if you go back to your house and there's no persecution, everyone is happy and singing together. If you go to your job and your friends come and you talk to you, hey, what's up, bro? I love you, man. If you go to your university, go to your homies and have that fun time showing pictures and all of that. Means that you're not in trouble with man. Means that your measure of preaching will not get you crucified. You get exalted most likely. Now are you ready for the truth? Because that we're gonna look into today in the lesson. And I have a simple title for the lesson today. What is in your core? What is in your core? You know, and you know, as a family of believers in the movement of God, we have what we call five core convictions. Yeah. You know, they say that the core conviction, said the core, I was looking at the internet, what the core means? It says the core is the deepest of your heart. It's something that sets your value system and your beliefs and who you actually are. It says the core is where the seeds are. So the question for you is, what is it, can we find, what kind of seed that you find in your core? Is it the pride seed? Wherever you go, you plant pride. Yeah. Is it a competition seed? Wherever you go, you want to see who is better than you so that you can overtake it. Is it an ungrateful seed? Doesn't matter how much happens. Wherever you go, it's never good enough. Or is it a word evangelization seed? What is, what is in your core family? First part of today's lesson. God's plan is for the entire world, not just for you. God's plans for the entire world, not just for you. Let's go to Acts chapter 16, family, verse 1. You know, right here in Acts chapter 16, we find that, that Paul actually goes around the churches, like double checking on them to see where their convictions were at to make sure that they were doing right spiritually. And giving them actually directions about what to do and how to do things. So let's go back there and see what happens here. You know, Acts 16, verse 1 to 5. Look at the Bible says, Paul came to Derb and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, 
whose mother was Jewish and a, a, and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believer at Lystra and, and Conium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who had, who had lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. You know what's powerful right here? Is that when they planted the church in Antioch, you know, in the verse 5, we can see that they grew daily in numbers. And we're going to have a day here, family. Then in the Johannesburg Christian Church, we're going to be seeing the church be growing daily in numbers. And that's awesome. But that's not all. The only way for that to happen is that the same thing, the same heart that they had, says that they were faithful. When he went around the church, he found faithful disciples. And that was the reason why they were growing in number daily. They were humble. You know how we know that they were humble? Because when they go around, you see that the church says that they went around them and asked, like, and gave them directions about what to do. And it says that when they obeyed, the church had growing numbers. Yes. Yes. You know, I started thinking about, like, why does God put leaders in your life? Why does God set leaders in your lives so they can give us directions so that you don't think that the idea came from you? Yeah. And that's the reason as well why God calls the leaders higher to be humble. Because that way, when they give the direction, they need to know for sure and for a fact that that has nothing to do with them. So whether you're leading a ministry or a group of people or someone, even Bible study, leading them to salvation is not about you. You know, and of course, when you see what is happening here, look at the church itself, the way they were humble. But I think about Timothy. You know, when Timothy was all, all there and, and then Paul comes in and asks him, like, Okay, I, I want you to come with me. You know, I, I, want you to, you know, I want you to follow me. I want to train you for the ministry. And now in the first century, how they were trained for the ministry wasn't going to some kind of school or some kind of watching video, video lessons on YouTube, but they actually walked with the evangelists side by side, and that was how they did it. And that's how we do it. That was how Jesus did it. That was how Paul did it, and that's how we're going to do it. We're going to walk side by side. We're going to learn. We're going to imitate to the heart. Now, that, if you're not how you do it, shows a lot about your character. But let's not drop the gun here. Maybe you have a better terminology, a better way, methodology than the Bible has. Maybe you found another way to be teachable and to learn and to how to become a leader in God's kingdom, right? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Bible is, didn't accept that, so needed you to put your finger in there. Right? God wasn't great enough to make the Bible perfect enough for you. So maybe if you add your values to it. Because look at this. What was calling my attention while I was reading. Because it talks about Timothy, right? And it says that his mother was a Jewish and a believer. Right? She believed in God. And his father was a Greek. Mm. doesn't say that he was a Greek believer. Probably Timothy didn't have his father as a disciple. Probably so means that Timothy had probably some kind of a lot of conflicts with his father because of his beliefs. The problem of his childhood, the problem of his growing up, didn't affect his ministry. On, his past, he didn't allow his past to affect his ministry. Oh. And many times you use that as an excuse, right? My past, man, you don't know how I grew up. You don't know how hard it was. You don't know how hard I come from. You don't know that when I come from, my father rejected me. My mom wasn't there for me. She didn't show love. We didn't have money. So now that I got this job and have money now, now I need, I need, I need to be there. I need to have that money. I need to have that security. Because the way that I grew up, Timothy was like, uh-uh, I want to allow my past to define who I am and who I'm going to become in God. And as a family of believers, that needs to be our conviction. Yes. Timothy's heart needs to be our heart today. Amen, family? Yes. All right, guys, with me. Yes. You know, I love what, uh, I love what Elvis Presley says. He states, it, it's crazy. I thought, Elvis Presley said that? I, I shall not sing. <laughs> But uh, he's, he talks about the cores are, and the value system and all of that. And he says that our value system, our core, are like fingerprints. Nobody's the same, but you leave them all over everything you do. So whatever you have in your heart, whatever you have then in your core, going to be present in everything that you do. So if pride is in there, everything that you do, doesn't matter what or how, going to have your fingerprint in it. You're going to be able to look at your work and say, that was this brother that did it. How can I say that? His fingerprint in it. There is a pride. I can see the pride there. 
I can see impurity in there. I can see jealousy from that sister. Oh, look at her fingerprint in it. And, no, and it's true because when you do it, you're going to put your heart into it. It's like giving birth to something. You know, and uh, man, and that's awesome because I was thinking about it, right? When the Bible talks about pride, it says that pride puffs up, right? So it's like when pride puffs up means that it, it grows, right? It gets bigger. So if you have pride in your heart, what ends up happening is that you're going to end up getting bigger and we'll have space for no other, no other thing. We not have space for the word evangelization there. We not have space for saintly leadership, for meekness, for gentleness, and much important for the Holy Spirit. Pride is going to puff up and going to push everything aside. And that's the problem. So what is in your core? What is it that you got to sacrifice just like Timothy did? It's awesome to look at Timothy because he was willing to go physical pain so that other people could stop make, make, get, uh, causing pain to God. That was his heart. It was like, it doesn't matter. I just want to preach the word. That's what is my core, word evangelization. For the sake of the mission, I'm willing to go through pain. I'm willing to make it happen. What? Circumcision? Let's go. Give up my job? Let's go. Give up my family? Let's go. For the sake of mission, I will do it. You know, and here he starts his second, his second missionary journey. And he says, and, and, and I know, I think about all of this, all the pain and suffering that went through that gave him scars. I want to tell you guys a story that I once heard. Now, there's two disciples that go up to heaven, and they go around, and you see there's a line with many, many other disciples, and they're holding their heart in their hand. And it's also because each one of them has a different heart. And then when they come to Jesus, they come into the presence of Jesus, and they're holding their heart in their hand, and then Jesus takes the heart of this one sister. And he gets the heart, her heart in her hand, in his hand, and he sees that there's full of scars. And he looks at each one of the scars, and he looks and he asks her, what is this scar about? And she says that when I became a disciple, I got baptized. I was so excited, I went and preached to my family. When, with the hope that I would accept the message, but they rejected and persecuted me instead. And Jesus asked her, was it worth it? She said, was it worth it? He goes and looks around and sees another scar. He says, what is this scar about? He says that once I went to my job and I was preaching there and I got persecuted by them because I didn't want to give up and compromise and come to the meetings of the body. Wow. Was it worth it? It was worth it. Wow. And then he goes to the second disciple and, and gets the heart of that disciple and looks at it. There's, there's nothing. Looks like a, that looks like a baby heart. And he just confused. He looks and asks, like, why, why, why your heart looks like that? What did you do? And the disciple says, Lord, I was so afraid of getting hurt. So when I saw that I would get hurt in that relationship, I withdrew my heart. When I went and they asked me to go to the minister, I saw that it would be so painful. So I withdrew my heart from it. I saw that if I wanted to come to Africa, give up everything, it would be so painful. So I withdrew my heart. Jesus take out his heart and show a heart full of scars. And he asked, which heart looks more like mine? Which heart looks more like mine? When I get to heaven, I don't want to get there and look at my heart, and my heart is different from Jesus' heart. I want that Jesus sees it and look full of scars, and I can say it. It was more than worth it. For the sake of the mission, I will do it, and I will do it again. How is your heart today? What is in your car? It's all about the heart, family. It's all about the heart. Acts 16, verse 6. Let's go there, family. And that was Timothy's heart. He was willing to go through it. He was willing to give up everything. Do everything for the sake of the mission. For the sake of the mission. He didn't do it for Paul. He did it for the mission. Acts 16, verse 6 to 13. Look what the Bible says. Paul and his companions traveled through, through all the region of Phrygia and, Gal and Galatia having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the providence of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once and left and lived for Macedonia. Concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. 
from throw as you put out to sea, to sea and, and, and sail straight for Somo Thrace. Yo. Oh, and the next day, we went to Naples. From there, we traveled to, to Philip, a Roman colony, and leading the city of this of district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days on the Sabbath. We went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place to pray, of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. Look at this. So we kept, no, it says that they were kept from preaching. But what was keeping them from preaching? It says that the Spirit was keeping them from, preach, from preaching. So the question is, what is keeping you from preaching? What is keeping you from opening your mouth and preaching the Word of God? Is it sentimentality towards your family? Maybe you feel like if you preach against them, preach against their beliefs, and they, 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 they would probably reject you. They would stop having that family relationship and family organization, that family feeling that you will have with them. Is it a fear of losing your job? Because maybe if you tell your, your boss that you can't lie because you're a disciple, maybe he's going to say to you that you can find someone else that can do the job. Maybe it's the fear of relationship with your friends outside of the kingdom. The problem is already there. You're looking outside the kingdom. There are going to always be problems there in your family outside the kingdom, in the job outside the kingdom, and the family outside the kingdom, because they are outside the kingdom. They don't have the same things that you have in your core, and always going to have trouble. But only if you preach the gospel. If you don't, you're going to have a peaceful life here in, on earth, but a trouble life in hell. In hell. You know what is very interesting about, about these scriptures here? You know, throughout the Bible, doesn't, doesn't it explicitly say what happened? Apparently, they tried to go to different places, but the Spirit of the Lord held them back through it. We can see that Luke really believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything that they're doing, he says, because of the Holy Spirit told us to. The Holy Spirit holds us back from doing it. So whether it was pestilence or whether there was some kind of disturbance of some sort, look and puff at the God guide and all, all the things that they went through or he would stop it. A lot of us can suffer with bitterness because we don't have the view of the sovereignty of God. Yeah. And that's the truth. We say that we believe in God. Yeah. The whole point of having a God is that God can do whatever he wants to do. Absolutely. So that's his sovereignty. If you really believe in God, you're allowing himself to go and do whatever. You can complain as much as you want. We will not change his will. Yeah. That's the sovereignty of God, and they understood it. Yeah. And that was the reason why they didn't get bitter in their heart when, when they were driven out and not going to Asia. Yeah. They were like, hey, man, that's the spirit. The spirit is holding us back. Let's go to Macedonia. Come on. And it's also because in the vision it says that they saw a man begging for them, please come, help us. There's people all over the world that's literally making the same prayer. I just want to see God. I just want to see God. I've been to so many churches, so many hypocrisy. I just want to see God. But sometimes God is trying to hold us back from staying in the same place and actually trying us to tell us you need to go there. But you're like, no, 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 I don't feel that it's the Holy Spirit. I maybe should just try in a different way. I should do it like this. And the Spirit of God, no, you, you need to go to Macedonia. You need to come and go to Mozambique. You need to go to Ethiopia. On, There's people there begging for the word of God. But the question is, are you surrender? Oh. You know, talking to the disciples this week, I was talking to them, and I, I used to say that a lot. And I know when someone asks you how you're doing, and they say, I'm fighting. You know, this day I was, I was thinking like, I was like, well, I'm not fighting, I'm surrendered. It's time to stop fighting, fam, for the will of God. And it's time to surrender to the will of God. If you're fighting because you want to surrender something, what are you fighting against? You're supposed to be fighting against sin. You're fighting against the wrong things right now. You know, it's funny because when you get disciple, and it's so hard, and it's like you're so overwhelmed, you try to reason with your disciple, right? Like, no, 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 I don't think that that's the way. I think, I, no, no, because of this and that, and, and try to reason around it, right? Because it's all pride. But you're trying to reason all of it. And, and, then, and you know why you can't just surrender? Yeah, you're just fighting. And then you come coming, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling overwhelmed because, you know, because of this and that. You know what the Bible says or the meaning of glory of God? It says that it's heavy weight. You're overwhelmed because you're trying to carry God's glory. You're not willing to surrender. You'll be overwhelmed by God's glory. 
God is putting his hand like, let me, let me see if you can hold it. You want to get the glory? You want to do it your way, right? Let me give you a bit of my glory. He puts just his hand. And then you're overwhelmed. Like, I'm so overwhelmed. I've been fighting my disciples. I'm overwhelmed. I'm fighting the advice. I'm overwhelmed. Of course you are. There's no surprise. Let's surrender to God's word, family. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. Let's look at something. Here. Look, at, look at this. How, how is it impossible to fight against the will of God? Acts chapter 5, verse 38. Acts chapter 5, verse 38 to 39. Look what the Bible says. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave this man alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activities of human orange, it will fail. But it's from God. You will not be able to stop this man. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. You're not fighting your disciple. You're fighting God. You're fighting God. You're not fighting the Bible. In the Bible studies, when you see the scripture and you don't want to change, you're fighting God. That's the reason it's so hard. That's the reason it's so hard to give up. It's so hard to give up on my job. You're fighting God. God is trying to fight you like, please, give up. Please. Because if I go and touch you a bit, you're going to feel it. I don't want, you know, when Moses is going and he says, like, if I go, I'm going to kill you. If I go, you want me to go, I'm going to kill you. So please surrender, surrender to my angels that I set in your life. Because it's going to be better. It's best for you to surrender now. Because if I go, if I go, I don't know, I don't know how the moms in Africa happens here. But I remember my mom, <laughs> they would call from the school and say, you, you're just doing nonsense, you're just fighting the kids here. You're just doing this and that. And they were like, yeah, you can tell her this and that. Tell her. And then my mom would just, let me talk to him. And like, mm. <laughs> Uh, why? <laughs> me no habla English. I don't know. I'll, I'll <laughs> let her give it to me. And then she would only say, if I go. Oh, the moment that she says that, like, okay, I got it. I got it. It's fine. I didn't even want to fight that much. <laughs> it's just surrender. Because you know what is coming. You know. Unfortunately, in many ways, we want to do things in our own ways. Yeah. You know, we, and you get angry at God. We get angry at God. I love the scripture in Job chapter 40, verse 8 to 9, that talks about how we try to, to put the blame onto God because of, for the sake of his righteousness. God will not compromise. Yeah. God cannot compromise his righteousness just to make us feel more comfortable. Yeah. And that's the truth. And, and, and then what happens is that you pull our heart back. We stop giving. Maybe, maybe your disciple challenged you on the way that lead the Bible studies. And see that now you, you can't do on your way anymore, you pull your heart back. Maybe your disciple told you, no, no, don't give the challenge that way. Give like this. And they're like, mm, I don't think that that's right. So let me stop giving challenges. I'm going to pull my heart back. And that's what you do many times. Think about God. I gave you my son. You want to pull your heart back because you don't want to follow leadership? I give you my son. I didn't pull anything back for the sake of your salvation. What are you not willing to do for the sake of the mission? It's time for us to put the mission in your core, family. It's time to examine what is in your core. God's plan is for the world, not only for yourself. Let's go to Acts chapter 16 again, verse 11. Let's keep on reading here. Look at the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verse 11 to 12. The Bible says, From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight to, to Samothrace. And the next day we went on to Naples. From there we traveled to Philip, a Roman colony, and then leading the city to the street of Macedonia. And he stayed there for several days. Right here in the scripture, we begin to find a pattern that Paul has for the rest of his journey, right? The Bible says that he says that he travels from Philip, a Roman colony, and leading, leading city of the district of Macedonia. And what Paul begins to do is that he goes to all the leading cities of the world and preach the word right there. He plants the churches there. And he's always like this. Over, we're going to be seeing in this missionary journey. And we're going to see him do this over and over and over again. And from there, the gospel is going to spread out and go out to the whole region. That becomes his plan. 
And that's the plan that we use today as a movement. We went to the key cities of the world. We have the crown of thorns. We went to Brazil, amen. We planted a church there in Brazil. Then we went to Chile to get Chile as well. Then we went to Jerusalem church to, sorry, LA. LA is a uh, city, city, cities of angels. Los Angeles. Amen. Then we came here to the motherland to Nigeria. Then from Nigeria we came to South Africa. South Africa we went to Uganda. Right? We went to Kenya. We went to Lusaka, Zambia. And next year, God willing, we're going to go to Mozambique, Maputo, amen. And that's God's plan for the entire world. You know, when you say that God's plans for the entire world, not just for you, we mean it. The mission is way bigger than the missionary. Paul's mission was way bigger than himself. Timothy's mission was way bigger than himself. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about Osa. It's not about leadership. It's not about a member of the church. It's about God. It's way bigger than us. God's plan is way bigger than us. No, you're here to fulfill God's dream. The success of the mission needs to, to be the missionary heart. Maybe your Macedonia can be you, Jay. Maybe God held BK back from going to feed to enter you, Jay. Because he knew that some brothers need to be saved right there. He knew that Moose needs to hear the gospel. He knew that the king needs to hear the gospel. That King B needs to hear the gospel. And Quebec needed to hear the gospel. What is your Macedonia? God put it right there in your Macedonia. But you need to go and take the land. You got to take the land. The job that you are right now is your Macedonia. But have you taken the land? Or had the land, the land taken you already? You know, when you look at the Roman Empire, there was Greeks in there to the point that they didn't really look like the Roman Empire anymore. Look like Greek Empire. And that's the problem if you don't take the land wherever you are. So if you don't take the land at your job, you're going to end up becoming your job. So instead of you taking the land there, the land is taking over you. So the Roman Empire went to the Greeks like, we're going to dominate that. And the Greeks are like, uh-uh, we are taking it. And they overthrew them. And that's what happens. Are we willing to take the land? Are we willing to do for the sake of the mission? Second point of today's lesson. God's plan is to reach all types of people. Not one type of people. God's plan is not for the Zulus. God's plan is not for the Africaners neither. God's plan is not for the Brazilians or South Africans. It's for all types of people. Let's keep reading Acts chapter 16. Let's go there to verse 13. Hey Amen. Thank you very much, Rose, for that water. Yo. Yeah. Acts chapter 16, verse 13, the Bible says, on the, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Tarini. Tira, thank you very much. Named Lydia, a, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to, to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. That's what a disciple do, right? <laughs> right that's right there. Come on, sus. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded them. They didn't, they didn't even ask to go. She was like, I beg you, come. If you really think that I'm a disciple, so you got to come. You need to have me here. I got to have you guys here because I wanted to be with the disciples. That was in her. That's an awesome heart. Come on. So I'm expecting some invitations after church. Um, see that you guys agree. Um, with lunch included, preferable. <laughs> but it's also because right here, Paul is keen on going to the place where he would find religious Jews. Religious people gathering. Right? And there was no synagogue there. So, and usually when there is no synagogue and the Jews have a place of prayer. He prays with anyone who could find Making them the mo the making the most of every opportunity that God gives him. Yeah. With the mindset that maybe, only maybe, there would be an open person. Yeah. And the open person, there was a person that feared God. Yeah. As the Bible says, she was a worshiper of God. And God moved her heart to respond to the message. Wow. Of no, not all God-fearing Jews except the disciples of Jesus Christ. So you can see the need of us to pray before we share your gospel. Yeah. Before sharing our faith. Yeah. And as we share our faith. 
Because that what God is the one who's going to open their heart. But so often what can happen is that we, instead of going and praying to God to open their heart, we think that we are the one that are going to open the heart. Maybe because, no, 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 because I know I play basketball, so he can relate to me. So they're going to open his heart. I'm a cool person. That guy looks like a cool person too. I'm black, he's black, we can relate. He's my cousin. You know, may, maybe that's what goes through our mind. We are foreigners together, so we can go together. So let, let's speak a bit of Portuguese. Maybe, maybe if you look at a person, if you can relate to them and rely on their own abilities. That's the reason that we go to the person, we relate to them. It's just because that relating, the relating part has to do with itself. Everything that it eats in you. So since that you don't trust God enough to open her heart, let me trust on what I trust the best. That is myself. Because I'm good like that. So maybe with my own talents, I can convert a person. And then when they get baptized, you see, look what I did. Aren't we awesome? That person is faithful because of me. My disciple. Where is your faithful people right there? You see, I baptize him. I baptize him, him, and him. Maybe that can give you a bit of pride, right? It makes you feel good. And that's how I felt most times, guys. To be honest with you. I think about my life when I first, when I became a disciple. My first three months as a disciple, what happened is that they put me to lead the team ministry. And I was super excited for it. And then two months later, they put me to ICCM and to lead two Bible talks and to disciple two people. That was with six months as a disciple. And guess what? Was I grateful to God? No. I actually thought that I'd serve it. I thought that because of my talents, because of my background, because of the amount of persecution that I was feeling at home, like maybe that's the reason. God wants to reward me now. Because I went through suffering enough for him, right? For his name. So it means that I deserve to receive something back. It's a trade. I give you this. You can, okay, it's fine. You can persecute me as long as you give me this. It's a conditional relationship. And that was my heart. And not for long. You know, pride, pride puffs up to the point that was exploding. Got to a point where after a sermon in the team ministry, my, this is disgusting, guys. You know how disgusting it is? Pride is disgusting. After the sermon that I did in the team ministry, my disciple came to me, awesome job, bro. Just wanted to give you a few feedback so that I can improve for the next one. I looked at him in the eyes and said, who do you think that you are to give me feedback? I think that I got it right. I did a great job. Don't you think that I did a great job? And that was what I did. And I couldn't see it. He stopped. He stood back and looked me right in the eyes. You are so prideful. You have been so prideful right now. You have no idea. The name of my disciple is Lucas Tria. Today he's my best friend. Thanks be to God, guys. Because I, re- I genuinely believe that if it wasn't for a disciple to call the sin out of my heart, I wouldn't have seen it. But unfortunately, I didn't see when he called out. So my pride kept puffing up to the point where God is doing things to me so that I would be taken out of all those things. What happened is that God took me out of all leadership. I took it out from leading the team ministry, took me out from the ICCM, from leading the Bible talks, from discipling people, and even from the choir. I was there, set. And for a good a year, I was there, I was like, it's fine. They're the one who lost it. They're going to see I generally believe that at some point they would see it, that they lost something. They would ask me back. <laughs> they did it. <laughs> a matter of fact, God raised someone way better than me. A guy way more talented. The guy could play every single instrument on earth. He could sing like crazy. He was so humble. He would come to us for advice, and I would be like, ah. Ah, ah. So, so it means that God is replacing me, so it means that I'm not, I'm not really replaceable. So it means that if I don't want to do God's will, God is going to pick someone that can do God's will. God to pick someone that can do for the sake of the mission. God loves me so much, but he will not compromise. And I'm grateful because at that moment I saw it. I'm like, oh, amen, amen, amen. I see it. I see it now, God. I will humble myself. I went to Vino and said, bro, what can I do to change? Stop being prideful. I was like, mm. <laughs> And they gave me challenges and, and, and things for me to work on my heart. And for God's grace, I could rep- repent as well. So there is open. You know, when you look at that woman, you can see that she was also influential. How? 
she was working with purple cloth. At that time, she would be like something that was really expensive. And her influence is shown by, by how she was also influenced her family to accept the message and to get saved. Yeah. And of course, I think about the sons of thunder, sons and daughters of thunder of the Johannesburg Mighty Christian Church. And now I think about the Leduabas, the sons of thunder right there, sons and daughters of thunder. They were so influential that Didi brought her brought into it. He was so influential that he came and brought TK into it. Then he came back and the other brought it and just the ministry kept growing. But that's the power of God in their life. We need influential people. We need all kinds of people in God's kingdom. Let's keep reading Acts 16, verse 22. That's what the Bible says here. Once when we were going, going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She, ate, she earned a great deal of money for her owners by, for, for her owners by for, fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. He probably got scared right there. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the, ma the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and throwing our city on an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept our practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Paul is going around the city and he's preaching the gospel. And then there's this slave girl. I don't know how, how she did it, why she was doing it, but she, that she was coming behind her and she was like, oh, these are the men of God. They are preaching for the mighty God and they are teaching you guys the way to be saved. And you know, when I was looking at this, it says that afterwards, it says that he got so annoyed to the point that he, said, he turned back, like, get out of here, so give me spirit. The name of Jesus Christ, the name spirit goes away. And then she stopped it. But you know what is awesome? Why didn't Paul rebuke that spirit before? Because it says that it was following them for many days, right? So it means that it wasn't the first time when she saw, said it, that he went back and rebuked her. So, you know, Paul was, maybe in Paul's character, he could be trying to avoid some kind of conflict. I'm not in my land. Uh, I'm not with my people. That's not my culture. Maybe because if I tell this to her, her owner is going to come back and they're going to bring us to a disoffro and all of that. And now, but then got to a point where he got so troubled that he cast a demon out. And maybe there's someone that is following you right now in your ministry. And just like her, she was saying the truth. She was saying that they were preaching the word of God and they're teaching the way to be saved. Yeah. So maybe someone in your ministry is there preaching the truth with you. But there's a devil spirit in them. Yeah. They're not holy. Yeah. And they're behind you and doing this over and over and over again. And you see it right through it, the pride in their heart. Yeah. And they're like, you look back and you see that brother there, being prideful, like, yeah, 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 I had that study, and, you know, because when I shared that, he, he, he understood it. He got it. Or maybe that sister, yeah, 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 I don't think that she's that good. And then you look at it, you look back at the people who are falling, and they're like, hmm, but you don't get annoyed enough. You don't get troubled enough to cast out the demon out of that. But says that Paul, he got so annoyed, even though she was telling the truth, He's like, get out of here, devil spirit, because only with me can be who is holy. This name they're proclaiming right now is not worth of your mouth. Come on, bro. Preach. Preach. That was the reason. He was like, even though you're saying the truth, come on, come on, come on. this name that are coming out of your mouth, your mouth needs to be holy as well. You're not holy. I do not accept unholiness behind me. And I, it's the same way. Of course, you know, it's that the evil spirit at the time was saying a lot of lies. So at the same time, she was trying to discredit. And that's what happened with pride of people, right? You look at your leader, you think that you're so good, you try to discredit with different ways. Wow. Maybe, maybe if, uh, you know, Osas is awesome, but I don't think that, uh, I, don't, I think that you should do like this. 
I love, I love him. He's, he's an awesome brother. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, there's something I would do differently. I, I would do different because the difference is on your own way. That's the difference. And maybe that how you feel, right? She was telling the lies there, trying to discredit them so that she could take the place. Maybe, maybe the devil spirit was like, maybe I can take Paul's place. And then if I start preaching the lies here, they're going to start following me. Paul's in Timothy's heart. I want to preach the gospel because I want people to get to the knowledge of the truth. But the devil spirit was like, I want them to follow me. That was the heart. Acts chapter 22 to the verse... Um, so it says that the crowd joined in the, in the attack against Paul and Silas. Verse 30, guys. Sorry. Uh, against Paul and Silas. And the magistrate ordered them to be stripped out and, be, and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into the prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet with the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, they, there was such a violent earthquake that the, that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open. And everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't arm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for, for light, rushing and fell, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? No, the lady's master got mad to have them beaten with rods, arrest them, and put them to jail. But did they get all worked up and bitter? Absolutely not. A lack of joy in the Lord would keep them from locked up in prison of despair. They remember God was sovereign on their life, and that God's sovereign would bring them actually the joy that they needed. It comes from God. Don't come from having a good life and just a comfortable life. And then, because they rejoice in God, they were there. Imagine this. I always want to think about this. I'm like, were they really singing? Like, they just got beat up. Then, if that was not enough, they were put into jail with all the dudes that they never saw in their life. And it says that all, day, all of them got their, 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 what is the name of this guy? Yeah, th those things. The, the coughs, loose. So it means that all the prisoners, not only Paul and Silas, it means that Paul and Silas were not even the only ones singing. They, when they were dead, they taught others to sing too. They're like, we're not going to be bitter here. We're not going to be complaining about the situation. I'm going to sing the Lord's praise. And that's what I love about the song ministry. We sing the Lord's praise. You know, say what you want. That week wasn't perfect. And many trials happened throughout the week. And yeah, they came here like, you know what, I'm going to sing God's praise. I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to get my heart real holy. And I'm going to sing the, heart, the God's praise. And that's what they did. And when they did it, the, 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 the guy saw it and I'm like, yo, I'm going to kill myself because if they flee, it's going to come up on me. So when they're about to do Paul, like, hey, chill out, bro. Don't, don't harm yourself. We're still here. Oh, oh God's sovereign. Don't rush. We're, no, don't rush. <laughs> Dude, we're all here. And then he's, I imagine the confusion of the guy. He's looking at Paul and Silas and all of them singing. And they're joyful like this. Like, look at all. Like, did you see what a song did? Did you see what God just did? And, and then the jailer's like, wait, they, they're on something. they supposed to, I, I had many, many slaves in here. They were all crying. What's up with these people? Yeah. Probably the songs that they were singing was the songs of salvation. Because yeah. how, how the heck he got it? Like, tell me how to be saved. Mm. They were singing God's praise like this, how to get saved. Yeah. They were preaching the word through the songs and hymns. On, they, so when the jailer gets there, he's been listening the whole long. He's like, man, this guy's a joyful. Then you get there like, teach me, how can I be saved? Wow. Look what happens here in the verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the, father, the jailer took them and, and washed their wounds. 
Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his, his household and set a meal before them. That's awesome. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. He wasn't content with his own salvation. He was like, man, I want other people to be saved. That's not about me. The mission is not only about me. I need all kinds of people. So I'm going to preach in my household too. And then he said that he was filled with joy. You know, so when you believe in God, guys, as we spoke about it, you've got to trust in his sovereignty. You've got to trust that God is God. And that is the very thing that makes him God and not you. Come on, bro. Because he can do whatever he wants. He's over us. He takes care of us because he cares about us. Yes. He put us to try so our hearts can get exposed yes. and that we can deal with it. Preach, That's all his plan. He, he, he's not doing this because he wants to arm you. He's doing this because he wants to spend eternity with you. Yes. That's his purpose. Like, I'm God. I know they're going to cause you pain, but trust me. I just want to be with you to eternity. I know that it feels so hard right now. It's painful. I know it. But please go through it. Because one day you're going to be with me in heaven. And that's awesome. That's what inspired my heart. Whatever God's putting me through, it's painful. It is. But he's doing this just because he loves me. Hebrews chapter 12. Because he considered me still his son. If I wasn't his son, he would have an awesome, comfortable life. If you want a comfortable life, it means that you don't want to be God's son. Yeah. Because he's going to try to drive you closer to him. That is his love. A fatherly love. Come on, bro. Let's go to Acts chapter 17, family. Let's go, bro. For the visitors here, if you guys are willing to change, trust God's sovereignty. Mm-hmm. Trust the people that are studying the Bible with you. Yes. And repent. Amen. Surrender. Stop fighting. Yes. Surrender to God's authority. Preach, bro. You know it. You already know it. Come on. By this time, you should know it. Yeah. The people that are in your life right now, all that they want is you to get right with God. Yeah. They want you to get holy. Mm-hmm. So you stop fighting. Let's surrender to God. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Come on, you're rich, bro. Jesus. Jesus. Let me just get some water. Drink it, bro. <laughs> so, <laughs> verse 1, the Bible says, When Paul and his companions had passed through Am- Amphipolis, and in Polonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his, it was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving, and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This is Jesus, who I am proclaiming to you, is the Messiah. He said, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and a quite few appoint prominent women. But our Jews were jealous. So they round up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and they started a riot in the city. They rushed to, to Jason's house in the search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out, the, out, out, out before the city officials shouting. These men who have caused trouble all over the, all over the world have now come here. <laughs> and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They all are defying Caesar the Christ, saying that there is one, there is, is, there is another king, one called Jesus. They didn't know the king. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the other posts bound and let them go. Here again we see Paul's pattern of going to the synagogue, preaching the word, and prominent people get, are baptized. This is going after here. It's going after to establish their church. Here you see that the charge that they want us, that accuse them to be accused of says that they see the disciples as troublemakers. There is a verse that is RSV version says, These are the men who, that are turned the world upside down for Jesus. That's awesome. They didn't turn for themselves. They did it for Jesus. On, they did it for the sake of the mission. And they were like, you know, like, I'm going to turn this world upside down. And the verse says that they need to be a hard guys. In the verse says when he talks about, and all of this says that we committed Paul, as committed Silas as well. And that they were willing to do for the sake of the cause. Yeah. That was what they were all about. Come on, bro. You know, and the, these people in the first century church, it was bent on the world contest. Each of them were called, com- 
to commitment to the sacred that the war cry was. Jesus is Lord. Even if it meant death. That's why the movement is unstoppable. You have to look at it and ask yourself, are you going to be as the first saint of Christian? Are you going to have the same kind of heart? Are you willing to do whatever it takes in your schedule, in your life, in your heart? Are you willing to be able to say every day the same war cry that the first saint through disciples said, Jesus is Lord. If you say that Jesus is Lord, you trust his sovereignty. You know, that's the most important thing in your life. It isn't something that we're going, going to work hard to make it happen. If it's really important for you, or it's something that we're going to really put an effort to it. Yes. It's something that we're going to put everything aside and we're going to be all about it. Yes. Come on, bro. In the verse 10, Paul goes to the smaller city of Berea because he's trying to escape the persecution. And we know the story about the Bereans and how good-hearted they were. God's word can change anyone. It's your quiet time change you or do you always come on the same, all the same way? Mm -hmm. wow. That's what a quiet time is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. Change your heart and heart. Yes. Third point of today, and the last point. Come on, bro. Be distressed at the condition of the world. Yes. The third point, be distressed of the condition of the world. Wow. Look at the verse 16 in Acts chapter, chapter 17. Go, While Paul was waiting for them at Athens, was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. He was distressed. When he saw that they had different type of idols in their heart, he was distressed about it. All that he could think about is like they are hurting God so much. They are hurting God so much. Remember that says what he was preaching about. He was preaching that God, Jesus Christ came here to suffer, that he had to suffer. That was all what Jesus was called to do. It's like Jesus was called to suffer for your sake. And you see you are raising up so many idols in your heart. Maybe the idol of family. The idol of how people view me. The idol of perfectionism. Everything that I do needs to be perfect. Come on, bro. You know, I love this through in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's open there. And we'll Let's go, bro. This is Paul's heart. Come on. That was how distressed he was. He wasn't distressed about his work and how many deadlines he had. He wasn't distressed about the exams at university. He wasn't distressed about his family not wanting to give him a new gift. Mm -hmm. I, ah, they didn't call me. They didn't say I love you. Oh. They didn't give me a gift this, not, this Christmas. Oh, wow. Come maybe, on. maybe this is what is distressing you right now. Mm -hmm. I won't be able to say, that, that was my heart. Amen. I want to be able to spend this Christmas and New Year with my family again. That was my heart. I was getting distressed because of this. But let's see what Paul was getting distressed about. Come on, bro. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. Come on, bro. Look at the Bible says, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool. <laughs> Paul is different. <laughs> uh, but if you do, if, then toler tolerate me just as you would a fool. <laughs> So that I may do a little boasting. It is self-confident boasting I am not taking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since men are boasting the way the world does, I too will boast. You get it put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or take advantage of you or puts on airs or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we are too weak for that. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool. <laughs> he understood that. I'm going gonna, gonna to boast about, but, but this is a fool. I, I'm being fool right now. But, but bear with me a bit. <laughs> I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of me, my mind to speak like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was spelled with stones. Three times I was, I was shipwrecked. I spent night and day in the open sea. I have been constantly 
on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger, from the, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger in the sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled, and I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirsty. I have often gone without food. I have, cold, I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. That was how he was stressed about. For the sake of the church. For the sake of God's plans. He was consumed by his plans. He doesn't, he doesn't say, for, for all of this, I was consumed by Netflix. I watch much more going, I watch much more Netflix than anyone else. I went to so many more days than any other brother. I'm suffering more to pay bills than anyone else. I pay more bills than anyone. I suffer because I don't have a father. And that's the reason that I suffer besides all of this. He talks about real suffering. And he says that besides all of that, the suffering does not take over his mind and drives him to be sorrowful. But he's concerned for the church. What are you concerned about, family? Work? School? Family? Or whether the brother sit by your side will make heaven or not? That needs to be our concern. The brother on my side, is he making heaven? Is he pleasing God? Is he glorifying my God? My father? Or is he mocking him? We know suffering is painful. I'm not, I'm not trying to diminuate that. I'm not trying to say that it wasn't painful the way that you might have been through. The things that you might have gone through, it was painful. Yeah. Trust me, it was painful. And I feel for you. But that cannot put that on God. Yeah. We cannot compromise because of our pains, because of our suffering. On, if it is for the sake of the church, it's for the sake of the church. On, and Paul understood that. Let's go back to Acts chapter 17. Verse 18 to 21. So we're going to look here about Paul. and Paul, Paul was smart. Paul wanted to do everything in his power to get people to get to the knowledge of the truth. He would see things around and say, how can I use that so that I can get it? I want you to get it. Tell me, tell me what, what do I need to do so that you surrender? And that was, God, was Paul's heart. Look here in Acts chapter 17, verse 18 to 21. So the Bible says, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with, them, with him. Some of them asked, what is the bobbler they are trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they, looked, they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are preaching, you are presenting. You all bring some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. And all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spend their time doing nothing but talking about and, and listening to the later, latest ideas. <laughs> They're like, I don't know what that guy was talking about, but that guy said it was onto something. They spent the whole day talking about it and trying to understand what Paul... Thank you very much. Bro. This guy is such a servant. Aww. He's awesome. You know, in Athens was a cultural and intellectual center of the world. And I've heard it said that the Romans were supposed to conquer the Greeks, but it really didn't. The Greeks were the ones who conquered the Romans. The Romans took everything that was Greek, and then the Greeks made it Greek again. And that was what happened. They took over. They end up like, okay, you're going to be over us. Yeah, we're going to still be Greek. And that's what happened. And then we see two main prominent philosophies right here. Right? We have the first one that is the Epicurean philosophy. So the Epicurus was the founder. The whole idea of the Epicurean philosophy is that the, the life is all about pleasure. There are a lot of Epicureans in our generation today. The enjoyment of pleasure was the highest end for the human existence. Yeah. Or as Plato would put it, the highest good. The highest good for a man is pleasure. That's what Epicurean philosophy was all about. It was probably the sentimental people. 
wanting to feel everything. They're always hurt. The private ones, they believe that they deserve to feel pleasure because of the amount of suffering that they went through in life. And they have the second one, the stonic philosophy, was found by Zeno. In this philosophy, God was the, the soul of the world. And the world was governed by fate. Even God was governed by fate. So they denied the morality of the soul. Virtue was its own reward. Vice was own punishment as well. Pleasure was no good and pain had no even in it. It was a very nam type of philosophy. So you, so you see where the two constructs are. So let's see here. So these ones are the nam ones that nam everything. Ones that has no emotional intelligence to deal with their emotions. Or they're not bold enough to do so. They have such a lack of trust that they don't trust. They want to trust a God with their emotions. That was a true type of philosophies. Or too sentimental or too numb. And that was the reason why they didn't get it. They're like on the extremes. They couldn't come to the center. And then when Paul comes to them and showed the center there. Guys, this is what you guys need to pick both of them together. Come here together. Let's find a middle ground here. Because that's what God wants you to do. They want you to be sentimental. And doesn't want you to be numb. Look at it here in Acts chapter 17. Now from verse 22. So it says, Paul then stood up in the, in the meeting of the Arespagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For, I, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even followed an altar with these inscriptions to an unknown God. So you're getting rid of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands. And, is, and if he needed anything, whether well, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations that he should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointment times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us, for in him we live and move and have our beings. As for some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. An image made by human design and, and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Wow. For he has set a day when he will judge the world in, with justice by the man he has appointed. That's Jesus. He has given proof of, his, of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them is near, is near but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionys Dionysus, a member of the, the Areopagus, also one woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Wow. You know what caught my attention here? The fact that Paul says, Therefore, since are God's offspring, we should not think that a divine being is like gold or silver or a stone or image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. This is the state of the world. Paul could identify it. He could see the idols in their life. And he emphasized the fact that God is not like gold and silver. Why? Because we are his offspring. He's not that little. My God, the God that I serve, is not as little as gold and silver. Neither he's as little as your skill or my skill. Because if I say that it's that little, can he have any power? You know, many times, unfortunately, I got my value from basketball, from studies, from money, relationships, and I ended up bringing that into the kingdom. You know, unfortunately, that's the reason that the Bible calls us to kill ourselves every single day, to carry a cross every single day. Because generally, generally believe that the idols, even when you crush them, they can cry back in. You need to come and deal with them daily. Every single day. And that was with me. Now I became a type when, and then I was healed already. I was thinking like, 
man, maybe, maybe I should try again playing basketball. Maybe, maybe I should go back to basketball and play basketball again. Yeah. And, and I, I, got, I got some places to go and play. I got, I got some teams, clubs, and stuff. And I was like, that, that, that's God opening up, mm-hmm. right? That, that's God opening the door for me to go and play, right? And then, then when I think about now, like opening the door for me to miss Sunday services, mm-hmm. opening the door for me to not be in meetings of the body and not be with disciples, is it God that's opening this door or Satan opening the gates? Is it really from God? And I ended up getting so much of my value from that. That was the reason it was so hard for me to give up. Because I couldn't see myself as nothing. My value was coming from it. So it means that if I kill that idol, if I destroy it, now I'm nothing. And I have no value. And it was hard to look at a mirror and see myself in it. I see myself, I don't have basketball anymore. <laughs> Finally, I was working in a multinational company when I became a disciple. Two weeks later, I got fired. The first two weeks, I was paying everything to everybody. I was taking everyone out, would go. There is this brother, Gabriel Spesamilia. He's an awesome brother. He's still there in the church in Sao Paulo, leading one of the regions there. And he was my disciple at the time. And like, yeah, bro, I got you. Let's go and pay. I'm going to do this and that and this and that. And at some point, he, he called me like, Bro, why are you so eager to pay everything? Why are you so eager to go and, and, and pay to every single disciple? Don't get me wrong. I think that that, that should be the, the idea of the heart. But are you doing this with the right motive? When I, when I examined my heart, I could see that I was doing that because I wanted people to need me. Now that's my value again. So maybe if I'm the guy that pays everything... Now they're going to come to me and, and they're going to be with me, right? Because they see me as a, a, a cool guy. They see me that if they come out with me, I'm going to pay everything for them. So they're going to give me, and, and now I can get my value from it now. Since I don't play basketball, now I can create this new idol made of, of gold, made of money. And I can worship it. And I'm going to raise him so high. And then when I was doing that, God was like, Yuri, I love you so much. I'm going to break that idol for you. And he broke that idol. Two weeks in, within the kingdom. Fired. I'm like, mm. <laughs> like wait. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. <laughs> and, and that's true, right? That's what God does. He's going to break that idol. Maybe you've been looking for a job and not finding it. Maybe you're looking for a job and not finding it because God is looking at it and like, if I give you that job, you're going to thrive away from me. You're going to get everything that is, is, is actually bringing you to me. I, I can't give you that job. Because the very thing, the suffering that is bringing closer to me, is going to be taken away. Wow. And now, I could see right now, the, few we- the past week, Satan trying to bring again an old idol back into my life. That was the idol of modeling. You know what's funny? Um, when I was here, I was trying to figure out ways to, to raise up money for mission and to how to, who, who I keep, could I help more the church and to raise up money to give to the, to the mission to, to Mozambique so that we could pay a few people as interns for a few months so that they could go and maybe look for jobs if they, they want to work there. And I thought, that's awesome, right? And that, that, that's amazing. That, that's the right heart to have. And amen, the, the motive was there. That, that, that's the motive that we should have that is all for God's kingdom, right? For the sake of the mission. But I, I wasn't as alert as how they could become my idol again. And then I'm there chilling at home. And then I see a message, 3D agency. I'm like, mm, I applied for this like last year. Was it last year? I applied for it last year. It has been such a long time. And then she said like, Yuri, I'm so sorry. We got lost. We lost your email. I never sent them my email. We lost your email trying to send you the contract and this and that. And I'm like, oh, that's God. It means you see it's coming up. So it means that I can go there and work and this and that. And I'm like, ah, that's God. I, I call us out like, bro, I'm so excited. Man. You can't believe it. Man, they're offering me to work with this agency. And I was like, that's awesome. And then Osas, I told us my motive. And I was like, yeah, that's, that, that's our motive, bro. I, I don't see why not. But, but before, before saying anything, pray to God. Pray to God and tell him to, to, to really frustrate your plans if, if, if that not from him. And then I end up kind of like, no, hey, hey, man, bro. Yeah, I will pray. I will pray. And then I put down the phone. I look a bit to my computer. And then I go out and say, BK, can you pray with me? Um, let's pray together. And then I explain to him everything that was happening. And then he said, 
Hey, man, let's pray for it, bro. God, God is going to make it clear, right? Um, I know God is some kind of way he's he, he going to make it clear. We're going to make it work. We're going to just demolish it. And then we prayed, and then I answered the lady. We have a meeting the following day. Everything goes well. She sends me the contract, and she already sent me different castings. And then I open the casting, and I start seeing the paycheck, like 16000 for one day. Like, hmm, that could help the church and me. <laughs> they, they send another one. Like, they said, can, can we skateboard? Like, of course I can. <laughs> and then this and this and this, and money, 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 money. Like, come on, God. You really want to support the mission team of Mozambique. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Like, look at God using it. I need to make, to make gold down. It's too hard to swallow. <laughs> and then, then I, I receive all those things and the contracts, and then I, I send to Osas, and Osas get it, and then Osas like, yeah, bro, thank you very much. Um, I don't, further more advice and thinking, I don't think that would be the best. And I'm like, oh, what do you mean by not the best? <laughs> what do you mean? I, I think that you didn't see the paycheck, right? Like, look there. Like, and, and then like, yeah, for the environment, is that the way that it can please God the most? God is going to find a way without you having to compromise in your convictions. You find you having to go there and put yourself in a, in a place where everyone is just defiled. And then I'm like, hey, man, I'm a surrender. And then I said, oh, what, what do you need to send to her? Tell her that I'm not interested anymore. I said, amen. I said to her, I'm not interested anymore. Thank you very much for the opportunity. She never answered. I explained to her, because I need to focus on the mission team. I need to focus on the gospel. I need to focus on God right now. Send her the link of the church. But she never answered. I think that she only read, I'm not interested anymore. But you know, that's idols that come up. And if you don't kill them right away, they're going to kill you. Let's go to Acts chapter 18. You know, we saw that Paul gave every effort to grow in his knowledge, to learn more about philosophies and stuff like that so that he could help people yes. to become all things so that they could believe in God. Yes. He was like, man, what, what can I do so that I can be more effective? I love BK. At home, you're going to see BK like, listening to... They, those guys use English that I have no idea of. <laughs> they sometimes I'm listening to the others that he's listening like, they're not speaking. They're probably speaking Sipedi or something. <laughs> But they, they listen to it and like the whole day, and he's like, and just here, you know, room and like, and you hear, yo, 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 yo. And he, you see PK like his phone like this, like, yeah. and his headphones on. <laughs> and like, man, and then he contacts all the name, he's sharing like this and this and that and this and this. And then I'm like, like wait, <laughs> where did you get it from? Like, no, bro, I was studying. Like, come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, that's the heart. Let's go to Acts chapter 18, verse 1. What the, what the Bible says here. Look at the Bible says. says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native on Pontus, who had a recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome, Paul went to see them and became he and, and because of because he was a team maker. As they were, the, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he, show, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, You blood be on your, he on your heads, on heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus, Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And so, and no one is, is going to attack an army because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. In verse 5 to 6, at a different point in Paul's ministry, he had to work a secular job. Working a secular job did not change his zeal to preach the word. You still see that every Sabbath, he'd go to the synagogue and try to persuade them. 
about Christ being the Messiah. In the verse 7 to 11, he probably preached the word at the synagogue ruler, and his entire family get baptized. Imagine if he got downcast for, for the rejection that he just suffered. When people don't accept the message, do you take it personal or do you trust God and move on? Because if Jesus was rejected, we too will face rejection. God also Paul's, do not be afraid. Because Paul was afraid. Yeah. We can relate with him. Even Apostle Paul got afraid. But because of God, because God commanded him not to be afraid. And let's be honest. God doesn't give the, most of the details. God says, do not be afraid. And Paul says, shut. Like, <laughs> that's it. Like, okay. <laughs> I won't, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> that was Paul. Like, he, he, does, he was like trying to reason with God. Like, God, God, why? Why shouldn't I be afraid? God, God I, I don't understand this and this. Maybe, maybe because of this and this and this. You know, he went to the synagogue to persuade and reason with them. He wasn't there to reason and persuade God. Once that God taught him, he was like, I'm sold. I'm surrendered. I won't be afraid. I won't be afraid. I'm going to go and preach the word of God to them. And he goes and preaches. You know, and as the title says, what is in your core? Roy Disney says, it's not hard to take decisions when you know what is in your core values are. It's not hard to take decisions once that you know what your core values are. Maybe that's the reason why you can't take decisions for God. Your core convictions are clashed with the core convictions from the Bible. When someone challenges you to let go of your job and go for the full-time ministry, it's hard because your core values and the value from it and you don't believe really in the, the word of evangelization. It's not really that in your core. Maybe that's the reason why you're clashing so hard to take decisions. When you're challenged to go and preach to your family. And it's so hard for you because it's clashing with your values. Maybe you value family a bit more than the Bible. Maybe you value your job a bit more than God's grace. Maybe you value friendships and relationships a bit more than Jesus dying on the cross for you. And that was the heart. If your core values are clear, crystal are clear for you, no decision for the Bible will be hard for you to take. Because yes. that is your value as well. Yes. That's your fingerprint. Yes. God, the Bible says that are making made in his li likeness. Right? So means that it says that likeness, of course, not appearance. Not that when look at me, you, you see God because he had a black power and was taught. No, no, that, that's not it. He's meaning the character like. That's it. That's the likeness. Having the character of God. And that's what it means because the character is what your value system, right? Mm -hmm. Remember what I talk about our values and our core values, your fingerprint? Mm -hmm. So when you take the, the literally the likeness of God to you, your fingerprint and you put it, there's the blood of Jesus Christ Come right on, there. Bro. That's how it needs to be your fingerprint. Come on. Well, everything that you do, when they look at it, they can say Jesus Christ in it. And that's the church that you want to be part of. Yes. That's the discipleship that are part of. That's the reason that people are here and they gave up everything to make it happen. You know, verse 22 concludes for us. Second, second missionary journey. And as we close out here, let's ask ourselves, does the vision of God and the lifestyle of the first century disciples describe your life? If not, then I encourage you to make change. You must make it. And if you are guest, I encourage you to study the Bible. To know what it means to live as a disciple. I will close out with one quote on mission. By Nate Sant, a missionary and a martyr. It says, people who do not know the Lord ask why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. They forget that they too are spending their lives. And when the bubble has, has burst, they will have nothing of eternal significance wow. to show for the years they have wasted. Wow. My brothers and sisters. It's to make eternal significance in God's world. And to God be all the glory. Oh.